Hello, everyone, and welcome back to AISC's Night School, Steel Construction from the Mill to Topping Out. Today is October 29th, 2018, and this is Session 3, Steel Fabrication, presented tonight by Christian B. Crosby. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce this evening's speaker. Christian B. Crosby, PECWI. Chris is the Operations Manager at Chambro Fabrication and Coating in Georgetown, Massachusetts. Mr. Crosby received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Rosemont Hallman Institute of Technology and his MBA from the Keller Graduate School of Management. Chris has over 25 years experience in steel fabrication encompassing bridge, building, and miscellaneous metals. Chris, thanks for being here, and I'm going to hand things over to you. Thanks, Brent. I appreciate that. Um, welcome. I appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy day to listen to Night School 18, Steel Construction, Session 3. Tonight we'll be talking about steel fabrication. As Brent said, my name is Chris Crosby. I'm the Operations Manager for Chimbro Fab, uh, Georgetown, Massachusetts. We're a medium-sized steel bridge fabricator that does bridge and building. As Brent alluded to, I've been doing this for a number of years, uh, over 25 now, and had many different experiences. And we'll go, some of, go through some of those experiences as we walk through uh, tonight's uh, session. I'd like to do a quick recap, uh, just a quick recap of sessions one and two um, from night school classes as they all kind of work hand in glove. Um, as you all recall, night school one was an introduction to the steel construction process where uh, Drew went through um, all, all seven different areas of the steel construction process. He started off talking about the manufacturing of steel, went through a brief outline of fabrication, spent some time in connection design, which we'll refer to later, um, talked about erection, erection engineering, some field fixes and solution, and then spent some time on quality control and quality assurance. Um, Drew did an outstanding job on that. Uh, the last class, uh, session two, was the manufacturing of structural steel shapes, and we had two wonderful metallurgists from New Yamada on speaking about how the, the structural shapes that we use to fabricate and build um, structural frame buildings are manufactured. And as I alluded to, or as I said earlier, I've been doing this for a number of years, and one thing I always find is every time I listen to the metallurgist talk, I learn something new. Um, interesting, I've been dealing with steel for so long, and yet every time I listen to them, they, they find some, something new to teach me, and I really uh, always enjoy and appreciate um, what they have to say. So tonight, as we said, we're going to ta take a detailed uh, tour of the steel fabrication process. Um, when they asked me to do this class, I thought there's a lot of different things that I could talk about, and we could talk for days on each one of the different um, areas of steel fabrication. But they told me I only have so many, uh, so many minutes to talk, so I had to pare down my thoughts and what I wanted to speak to. So I, I tried to come up with five different areas that I'm showing here on our agenda um, that I think are important in the steel fabrication process. You know, we could ju just jump right into bullet three and start talking about the production because that's what everybody wants to see is the, the pictures in the shop and us making sparks. Um, but there are some things that, that lead up to the ability for us to start making sparks on steel that we need to address first. So I, I came up with these five areas as our agenda for what we're going to do. And the first one is, is detailing. And I know there will be some objections in saying, hey, detailing is part of project management. No, project management is part of detailing. And yes, you could argue either side. But there's some important nuances between detailing and project management that I want to spend a little bit of time clarifying. So just bear with me, and we'll get through those uh, items. Um, but So we'll start out with detailing, we'll spend some time in project management, then we'll get right into the, the meat and potatoes of it, if you will, and that's the production. That's what everybody wants to see is, is uh, us making sparks. And one thing I'll allude to, and I'll say several times throughout the presentation tonight, and I say it time and time again, 
as I manage uh, steel fabrication plants is that there's two things I need to, before I can start fabricating your building, and that's drawings and steel. And I think that detailing to take care of the drawings and project management typically takes care of the steel. So there's where I came up with, um, uh, I guess, the, the outline for tonight. So after we get done producing the steel, then, we, you know, hey, we've got to put it on a truck and ship it somewhere. And then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about quality control, not, not sawing sawdust that uh, Drew talked about on session one, but looking at, it, looking at it from quality control in the fab shop itself. So there gives us a roadmap on what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, so jumping right in, let's talk about detailing. And under detailing, there's five different areas I want to talk about specifically, or if you will, prescriptively. Um, and those five areas under detailing are the project kickoff, you know, what we do to set the job up. Then I want to talk about advanced bills of material, or what we call ABMs, and that's how we start our mill order. And then after that, I want to talk, talk for a while about detailing standards. Then I want to talk about the erector needs, and then I want to talk a little bit about submittals. So those are the five areas under detailing um, that, uh, that, we need to, that we need to address. So let's jump right in and talk about project kickoff. So under project kickoff, we, the first thing we want to do is talk about the format of the drawings. And what I mean by that is the format of the drawings that the detailer is going to do. Is he going to or are they going to um, draw on the board? Are they going to do a 2D CAD layout? Or are they going to model the job? So that's the first question. And here's a dear friend of mine that we both started out as detailers. And um, he, he's a little bit younger than I. And you know, he actually started out on a 2D CAD station where if you had a picture of me, I would have been in front of a board. Um, nowadays, most jobs are modeled. That seems to be the industry norm that we're doing that. But when we start talking about modeling a job, we need to know, are we getting a model from the designer? Is the designer providing us a, a, a wireframe model uh, that we're going to uh, expand upon and import into our detailing software and then connect that model? Or are we starting out from scratch? Are we going to take the design documents that have been issued to us? Um, most are issued electronically now, but print out drawings and then build our own model. So that's kind of what we need to start with on the project kickoff, getting the detailer going. Once we figure out the format, um, we'll go to scope of supply. What are we doing? Are we doing the structural? What's our responsibility on connections, which we'll get into a little bit later here? And then the miss metals. Are we doing the egress stairs and rails? Are we providing toilet partition supports? Are we doing um, brackets for the wash basin? And you know, who's picking up the window washing davits, um, all of which have um, kind of bitten me in the past when we haven't really defined our scope of supply with detailer. I can't tell you the number of jobs that we've gotten a call on saying, hey, we're missing the lentils. Oh, that was part of our scope. Okay. So being, a good, being diligent in outlining that scope of supply for the detailer so those items aren't missed really helps out. Um, once we know what the scope is, then we need to know sequencing. What does, the, what does our customer want first? Where do they want us to start? Where do they want us to start erecting steel at? You know, if it's a high-rise building, you know, we're pretty much bringing them up, uh, bringing up all four corners at the same time. If it's a spread-out building, you know, are we starting in the northeast corner? Or are we starting in the southwest corner? Where are we going? Because the detailer needs to know that so, he starts in the, so that they start in the right corner of the building so that as we're making submittals and start fabrication, they are still detailing the rest of the building, and then the erector can start um, flying iron, if you will. So detailing modeling has come a long way, and I'm sure a lot of you are a lot more versed in this than I. But you know, here's different things that we can do as we model a job. Here they've overlaid a, a model onto a picture and have been able to uh, show what it looks like. Um, the other thing that we're doing during the project kickoff with the detailer is a review of the design drawings. Um, so many times it's, hey, here's a job, go ahead and get drawing on it, and we don't take the time to go through, hey, let's look at the plans and elevations and sections. Where, where do we see uh, problems that could arise? Uh, let's look at the notes on the design documents to make sure we're capturing all of, you know, we're properly interpreting um, the design intent and capturing those. We need to review this, the 5120 spec and make sure that we're picking that up. And then a good review of the special provisions to make sure any notes that are provided to us are picked up on that. 
detailing modeling. It, it, another thing that we can do with the detailing modeling, which I've always found amazing, is we take an existing structure and are able to um, add additional um, steel to that, uh, which makes it very beneficial. So we've gotten the detailer kicked off, so the first task that the detailer needs to do for us is to generate the advanced bills of material, or as I referred to as the ABM, because then we need to get our mill order in. Now this is all predicated on the size of, a, of the project. If we're just doing a simple um, single story school addition, I'm probably not going to order my material from the mill. But if we're doing a very large school, or we're doing a stadium, or we're doing a spread out industrial complex that has large tonnage, then yes, we're going to go to the mill. So we need to get a listing of the beam and column and bracing sizes so that we can get our mill order, or get our mill tonnage reserved, and then get our mill order placed. Now, depending upon the speed, and I know every contract I sign says time is of the essence, uh, but we have to make a determination if we have time to model that uh, to get the, uh, the model up and running so that we can get a, a pretty exact ABM, or do we just need to do it by hand? Uh, sometimes doing it by hand quickly can uh, help us get that tonnage reserved quickly. Now, there are instances where we've been under the gun to hit a mill rolling and get our tonnage reserved, so we will actually go to the estimate just to reserve tonnage. Uh, but before I pull the trigger on this is exactly how many linear feet of that beam I want, I want to see my advanced bill of material from the detailer. Now I've talked a lot about the main material, the beams, the columns, and the bracing, but that didn't address the detail material. And we'll, we'll spend some time talking about detail material because that falls under um, our, the standard connections that each uh, fabricator likes to use. Um, will dictate how they're going to order that detail material. Because on a typical job, you might not have enough tonnage to be able to go to the mill to buy mill quantity of detail material. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, we will talk about purchasing in the next section, which is project management. So here's an example of a detailing ABM. Um, this is one of our ABMs, and uh, I had to cut the bottom of it off so that you all could see it. But basically, all it does is it goes through and lists uh, the different uh, section sizes. So we get number of pieces, the section size, the length. Uh, we have on here the finish, which H HDG is hot dip galvanized. Uh, not necessarily relevant, but uh, for whatever reason, we have that on our advanced bill of material. We do have piece marks, our ship marks. That's the next column that says marks. So that's the shipping mark. Um, and these are columns, because we can see the C represents it's a column. Um, and then the drawing number. So they, they went through and actually modeled this job because it's already assigned a shipping mark to them. Um, and it gives us the order lengths and so on. Um, and we can see the material specification. Now you're going to say, well, what job is it for? I don't see a job number. Well, that's at the bottom of the sheet. And unfortunately, I had to, uh, had to crop that off to be able to make it um, large enough so that you could see it on your end. Um, nevertheless, that's what an advanced bill of material does. Now what we can do with that advanced bill of material is we actually get an electronic copy from the detailer. And if it's done by hand, then we have a paper copy. And then it's inputted into our software program where we go through a nesting process. Now before we talk about that nesting process, let's talk for just a minute about our preferred grades. And this is important um, to steel fabricators that we're using preferred grades. And what that means is that it's readily available at the steel mills. So where, we can, where can you find this information so that you know, I'm not ch chattering in your ear the next time you're designing a steel structure and go, you know, that guy was droning on about preferred grades, but I don't know where to find it. Well, it can be found in the steel manual. Um, and we'll see some tables right from the steel manual, and it's in table 2-4 and 2-5. But what we'll find in there is that the wide flange, our, our preferred grade is the ASTM A992. For tubing, it's going to be ASTM A500 grade C. Channels, we can get grade 50, but I think typically we're still seeing A36. Um, angle, I can get both A36 and grade 50. Um, your S's and your I shapes is still ASTM A36. Um, plate, um, they, they say A36 is still a preferred grade, but uh, almost every fabric, most fabricators, let me just say that, most fabricators I know are stocking uh, A572 grade 50. Uh, when it comes to their connections in both uh, plate and angle, they'll stock that so they can take that um, extra benefit in having that. And most mill certs, the mill test reports that we see that come in on angle and plate are dual certed. They're dual certed to both A36 and A572 grade 50. 
Um, nevertheless, uh, plate is, uh, you can get it in A36. Um, uh, bolts, you, know, you need to see the table on 2-6, which I'll show you here in a minute. So here's table 2-4, and across the top there we can see uh, steel type, ASTM designation, your F sub Y, your F sub U, and then wide flange, um, and then the other shapes as you go across. And then as you come down under the ASTM designation, now unfortunately I cut the table off to make it large enough for you to see it that I cut off the wide flange where it says A992. Uh, but you can see that. And if you go to the steel manual itself in table 2-4, there you can find um, the preferred grades. And again, here's 2-5 for plate and bar. And you can see that, oh, they do, they do list um, the grade 50, uh, A572 grade 50 as a preferred grade for plate and bar. Um, as I said, a lot of the fabricators, that's what they've standardized on. Um, here we are for our um, structural fasteners. This is table 2-6, as I promised. And you can see over here, here's our, A30, our A325s and our A490s. Um, and again, here's all the tables for you, and it gives you your TC bolts, and then it gives you your, uh, your specification on your nuts and your washers, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and all this good information is available in the steel manual. Now, it's my understanding that that steel manual is now also ava available um, uh, electronically. So if you're more of an electronic person that you know, prefer to have your reference material, um, that way you can get that from AISC also. Uh, we can't forget our anchors, and I cut out a piece uh, of the steel manual that shows our F1554, and it's either grade 36 or grade 55. Um, those are the, the common preferred grades, if you will, on the anchoring material. So let's talk a little bit about detailing standards. That's the next point in our detailing portion of this, of this session. Um, why do we have to have detailing standards and what are they? So detailing standards are simple standards that we tell, we the fabricator, tell the detailer how we want to see our drawings, what our standard connections are. Um, each shop is different, so we want the presentation of our drawing um, different. And it, you've probably seen this if you've done any shop drawing review in your life. You see that, hey, why does this drawing look different from the drawings I just reviewed last week? Because each shop is different. And what I mean by that is the equipment level, or the different equipment that they have, the level of automation, and the skills and abilities of the employees of that fabricator. Uh, connection details, and, and this is not, I'm not referring to connection design at this point, but just the simple details. What are the standard connections that our shop would like to see? If we're highly automated and we have beam, beam lines that can drill holes in the matter of seconds, we prefer to have our standard clip angles bolted, bolted, so that our fitter has to merely pick up the correct angle, slap it on the beam, put the bolts in the holes, and um, tighten up the bolts and away it goes. If we're not as automated and we're really good and highly skilled at welding, I would prefer to have welded bolted clip angles or maybe possibly even shear tabs where I have to fit the material on and weld them because we have highly skilled labor that can make those welds relatively quick. And then those are the kind of connection on standard details that I'd like to see. So a lot of that goes into um, what makes our detailing standards and what we expect to see on those shop drawings. Uh, now, I've managed several shops now that they have gone paperless on the shop floor where the fitters and welders actually have a tablet-like device out on the floor and they're looking at it. So that again goes to the detailing standards where we only want to see one ship mark on each sheet. Back in the day, when we, drew draw, when we detailed by hand, we would put four beams on a sheet and two columns on a sheet, and then we'd have a big um, sheet at the beginning that we called a gather sheet where we collected all of our detail parts and detailed them out. Now we get piece drawings, and there's one piece on each sheet, and then we get one shipping mark on each sheet. Um, so each shop is different on how they want their drawings to be seen. So here's an example of a, a Detail, a detail sheet that we were just working on the other day, and this is a truss um, uh, project that we're working on, and we have very specific ways we want to see that sheet laid out. I want to see one ship mark per sheet. I want my bill of material in the upper right corner. 
Um, I want standard presentation where I'm looking at the elevation at the bottom in a rolled out section of the top view, and then if there's a right hand or a left hand rolled out view, I want to see those accordingly. Then I want to see on uh, trusses, I want to see chain dimensions. And what I mean by chain dimensions are these dimensions here where we're chaining along on my panel points. But then on my holes, I want to see running dimensions, and these are the running dimensions here that we can see pulled. So there's different uh, standards in how we want to see things. Because when we start looking at different connections and how things run together, um, the model makes it very easy for us to zoom in. But if we can give the detailer standards, then the actual detailing process goes a lot quicker on how we want to see things. Because at the end of the day, we have to get the steel in the air, and the faster we can do it, it keeps our customers happy. So when we go through a big, um, and this is a football stadium that we're looking at here that we fabricated and erected, um, if we have standards on how we like to see things, it makes it go quicker. It makes it easier for everyone, the fabricator and the erector, um, working together. Now, ha having said all that, um, let's talk for a minute about the erector's needs. And when I talk about the erector's needs, there's four specific areas I want to talk about. Now, we could, we could be here a month of Sundays talking about all things on the erection side of the house. Um, but again, they've limited my time, and so we'll stick to these four items. And one of the other sessions that's coming up um, in, I think, two weeks talks about um, erection of the structural steel. So I'll keep my comments brief on erection, but I wanted to talk about it because the first thing that we want to talk about under erection is the erection drawings. Basically, we're making a big jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the designers have gone through and said, this, this is what we need to make the building stand up. And the detailer takes all of those parts and pieces and makes a jigsaw puzzle out of them. And then we have to give an erection drawing to the erector so he knows how to put all those puzzle pieces together so that at the end of the day, we have our steel frame structure. Um, under there, it's nice that when the detailer is getting kicked off, we know what the column splices are if we've got multi-story columns, um, and we can find those. AISC has got those in the steel manual, again, and it's table 14-3 that starts listing, and I've got a picture of some of the typical column splices. And a lot of this has to do with when the project manager kicks off the erector, they talk about what are, you ex what are your expectations on the column splices? What would you like to see? And if the detailer has that information on the front end, we draw it one time instead of having to draw it multiple times. Uh, the next item is perimeter cable holes. If the detailer knows that, when he starts off the job, he can include those, um, no problems. Um, but if we have to add them later, then it gets to be problematic, if you will. And then the last bullet under um, the erector needs is assemblies. What is the shop going to assemble? What's going to come out one big assembly? Or is that going to be stick built in the field? What, what have they agreed to in their scope of supply, and what do we need to provide? So an erection drawing. So we looked at that truss earlier on the job, and here we are looking at those trusses. There's our shipping mark to tell us exactly where it goes. Unfortunately, I cut off the column mark that it attaches to. And there's another truss with its shipping mark right here that gets erected in there. And then, of course, we have some angle braces to hold that up. And then if you can see here, we've also got some other angles coming off that column. And they actually do have a bolting list, point-to-point -point list on this drawing. Now, I don't necessarily like the point-to-point the -point list on my erection drawings because it makes them a little busy. Um, but nevertheless, that's the way the detailer did this one. And he's got all the information right there to, for the erector to start putting the parts and pieces together to make that steel frame project. Here is a column splice detail. And again, this came right out of the steel manual. Uh, section 14-3, and there's a whole bunch of different ones. I just grabbed the first one, and it shows a typical full pen splice on the flanges with a bolted web. Um, and again, the erector will have a lot of input on how we present those. And if, you know, if they're design detailed out, yes, we will follow the design details, or we'll submit an RFI, and we'll talk about RFIs here in a little bit. Um, to perhaps change that to something that's more user-friendly uh, to the erector. But nevertheless, it's good to have those all defined out at the start of the job so that the detailer can incorporate that as he's going through his, or as they're going through their model. Uh, perimeter cables. So we can see the bright yellow uh, arrows that I put on there in the, in the background here. The first one you can see is showing perimeter cables, and those pass through the column. So it's nice to have those holes in the column. A lot of other things that we see is perimeter railing, as I noted right here, 
um, that's attached to the structural steel. So it's nice to have those bolt holes already included in the top flange so that the erector simply merely just bolts his railing down and then he's got his fall protection set up and he's guarding the edge. So those are nice things to include. And then when we include them, then the uh, engineer of record can see those as he's going through or as they're going through the approval process um, and understand what we're doing there. So here's just another shot of the perimeter cable and it's nice to include those. So then the next thing that we talk about uh, under detailing is what are we shop assembling for the erector and what is the erector going to stick build? So here we are looking at a structure, a steel frame structure, and we're shop assembling all of these trusses into one big piece um, with half a column. Here's our column splice detail. And then here we are erecting that same piece in the field, and here's our column splices again. Um, so the erector knows that, hey, I've got to make one big pick. I've got to make sure I have the right size crane. Or no, I'm stick building that, so I've got to have enough people out here to make sure that we can get the work done in, a, in the right time. So knowing that on the front end um, is helpful uh, for the detailer so we, they're not having to redraw stuff. Okay, so under detailing, one of the, other, one of the next things that we talked about in our um, agenda items for the detailer is submittals. So where do we go to find information on the submittal? So I have noted up here, uh, COSP is my shorthand for Code of Standard Practice. So if we pull up the Code of Standard Practice, which is also nicely included in the steel manual, um, we go to Section 4 and it talks about approval documents. So 4.1 talks about the owner's responsibility. What is the owner's responsibility? Well, in, in, you know, there's a lot of um, in, uh, nice verbiage around this, but at the end of the day, it's released for construction design documents. So, you know, here you go, Mr. here you go, uh, fabricator of record. Here is the released for construction design documents. And then 4.2 addresses the fabricator's responsibility. So approval documents. Um, so the structural steel shop drawings, erection drawings, and bedman drawings are where parties have agreed that, hey, we're going to provide this in a digital model, which is becoming more and more of the, the norm, is, is um, it talks about those um, documents that we're going to provide. So it's the, the steel shop drawings, the erection drawings, and the embedment drawings. Now, it's been a while since I've actually submitted paper drawings. Everything's done electronically, but we've had quite a few jobs here recently that will accept the model and the um, – uh, engineer of record will approve the drawings uh, via the model. Now, the next section under uh, approval documents um, under the Code of Standard Practices 4.3, use of digital files, you can read that at your leisure. 4.4, and this, I know, this word gets, gets us all um, spun up, especially the lawyers, is the word approval. But what we're looking for, and, and the Code of Standard Practice does use that term, and I know a lot of the uh, the lawyers prefer not to use that term, but nevertheless, the Code of Standard Practice uses that term, and basically what we're looking for from that is that the, the detailer, or the fabricator via the detailer, has correctly interpreted the contract documents. You know, have we used the right size beam, brace, column? Um, if, the design, if the connections have been design detailed out, have we used the right connection material? Do we have the right size weld? Do we have the right stiffeners and shear tabs and number of bolts and you know, have we interpreted the contract documents properly? If we're doing the connection design, has the connection design, the connection details been reviewed and approved? And then lastly is release us to begin fabrication. So that's what the approval process is. Uh, the next section in uh, approval documents is 4.5, and that's uh, fabrication and erection documents not furnished by the fabricator. Now, I, I was tempted to gloss over this section. Uh, early in my career, we, we, we had quite a bit of this. We did, I did a lot of industrial work, and uh, the different industries, heavy industries that we worked for, provided their own shop and erection drawings. Um, and then, then for a number of years, I didn't see any. And then lately, I've seen quite a bit more of the fab and erection uh, documents are being provided by actually by the engineer of record. I've seen that on quite a few jobs here recently. So I thought, hey, I'd at least let you know where that information can be found, and that's in uh, 4.5. Uh, and the, the next part is the uh, 4.6, which is the RFI process. And basically the RFI process is a process in which we as the fabricator via the detailer or vice versa 
we need interpretation and implementation of the contract documents. Hey, we, we need a clarification here, or we'd like to make a revision, um, something along those lines. We don't have enough information. We don't understand. Um, and that's what the RFI process is for, so that we can submit a question to make sure that we're interpreting and implementing the contract documents properly. And then 4.7 addresses erection uh, documents. Um, so still under submittals. We're going to talk briefly about connection design because I don't want to get too far in the weeds on connection design because I know that it was covered in detail. Um, Drew did an excellent job of covering that in detail in the first class, um, so I don't want to saw sawdust there. But then next week's class, 18.4, is connection design again. So I don't want to steal Chad's thunder from next week. Um, what I do want to do is give you the information on where you can find this um, more information about connection, or about connection design, yes. Um, and that is again in the Code of Standard Practice, uh, Section 3.1.1, and that gives the owner's de uh, designated representative for design, or what we refer to as the ODRD, uh, three options for connection design. Now there's a lot more information around these three options. So you can go to uh, 3.1.1 and find all of that information, but I at least wanted to touch on those three briefly. And again, not stealing from what Drew did or what Chad's going to do, but at least making you aware of where you can find this. Uh, option one is that the connection, uh, that the design documents you know, completely detail out the connections. They show exactly what they want. And we see a lot of this on the West Coast or in high seismic areas. Option two is that the detailer shall complete, select and complete uh, the connection design um, using the uh, steel manual and the tables provided therein. And then option three is that the fabricator will uh, contract with a licensed engineer where the work is being performed to design out the connections. Now there's two options under three, and again, I'm not going to get too far in the weeds here, but I wanted to make you aware of the, these three options and where to find that information. Again, more to each one, but I wanted to give you a brief outline because I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about them because we did spend some time talking about standard connections that each, de that each fabricator likes to see. So summarizing, because we've been through a lot um, under detailing here, we talked about the project kickoff, getting the detailer going in the right direction. We talked about the advanced bills of material so we can get that material reserved, the tonnage reserved at the mill so we can make our mill order. We talked about detailing standards and how each shop is different. They have different equipment. Um, they prefer different types of uh, standard connections. They have different um, skill levels in their plant. Uh, we talked about what the erector is going to need. We talked about um, the erection drawings and how to interpret those. We talked about uh, column splices and perimeter cabling and temporary handrails. And then we, talked, we spent a lot of time talking about submittals and where to find that information. So that kind of wraps up detailing. So from there, we're going to jump into project management. Again, a lot of you would say that uh, project management and detailing go hand in glove, and they do. Um, but again, I go back to I've got to have drawings and steel to start making sparks. So we've got our drawings done, at least they're underway, and then we talk about project management. And our project management, I've, I've broken it down into six areas. And you, again, you could argue all day long that there's more than six areas, and I would agree with you. Um, Nevertheless, uh, project kickoff, very, you know, so the, the six areas, project kickoff, scope of supply, which are very similar to what we talked about in detailing, ordering of material. We'll spend some time talking about ordering material. How do we get that mill order placed? Uh, managing submittals, budgeting, and schedules. So jumping right in, project kickoff. This usually occurs at the same time as setting up the detailer. On big jobs, uh, this will involve a construction manager, if there's a construction manager in the contract, um, in the contract line, or if it's just the GC, um, the erector, other subs, even sometimes we'll take our detailer to the big project kickoff just so that everybody's on the same page. But it's important to have that erector sitting there and the GC so we can get, hey, making sure we're starting from the right corner of the building. I, I remember doing a very large industrial project um, in uh, uh, central Indiana. A very large project, and we started in the wrong corner of the building, and that caused a lot of heartburn for a lot of people. Um, nevertheless, um, it's very important that uh, you know everybody's sitting at the same table. Again, scope of supply very similar to the detailing. Um, scope of supply review to make sure that none of the items are missed. And if you go through all of these, and, and a lot of fabricators um, have checklists that their project managers sit down and go through, and that's the safest way to make sure that nothing's missed. Okay, so the meat and potatoes under project management is ordering material. 
So we talked about how we get the detailer ABM. They give it to us. Uh, a lot of fabricators are electronic now, so they'll get an electronic uh, data file, and then they'll nest that data file into their software that will do um, uh, nesting to tell you, okay, these are the lengths you need to set. Because in that software program, and there's several of them on the market, and I have no preference on one over the other, um, you'll see some of the, the shots of screenshots of the ones that we use. But in that nesting material, you can tell them that, hey, look, on the wide flange sections, I can order in five foot increments starting at um, 30 foot. So I can go 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55. Um, and then you can say, hey, I can't go over 55 on this size. You can set all kinds of rules in there so that it'll nest it according to what the mills can produce. When it comes to the plate material, um, some fabricators will just do a rough estimate on square footage by thickness and then say, okay, we're going to order these type of sheets and that'll cover it. Um, others use software packages that will nest automatically. Um, the other thing on ordering material is if there's additional re testing required, if the the ODRD decides that, hey, I want uh, CVNs. Uh, you know, I want impact resistant material because I'm going to be outside and I'm going to be under a dynamic load and I want to make sure that my beams and columns um, meet the impact resistance requirements, then I'm going to have, you know, I want CVNs ordered on that. Or there's other, other testings. And if you look at the supplemental requirements for ASTM A992, it will list all the supplementary uh, testing and requirements that you can order your steel to. Um, so when we talk about the mill order, so when we're ordering main material, there are bundle quantities. So when we go to the mill, different, or different sizes of wide flange beam, they won't just sell me one beam. They might bundle three, four, five in a bundle, and you'll see pictures of that here shortly. Um, we have to check the, the bundling quantities. Then we need to check the mill rolling, and we can get all this information online. All of the mills post all of this online. You'll see screenshots right, that I took right off the, the, the um, uh, steel mill site themselves. Um, you do have to order minimum truckload quantities, which is roughly 42 to 48,000, depending on uh, the, the, the shipping company. Um, and here we go. All the mills have this information online. So you can go to Nucor Yamada, you can go to Steel Dynamics, you can go to any of the bar mills, you can go to any of the plate mills. All of this information is easily readily available online. And I believe AISC.org also has all this information online too. So if you're wondering, hey, is that a common size? Is that something we can get? How often do they roll that? Um, again, if we're doing a, a small addition to a strip mall, I'm going to go to a local warehouse and order one beam, one column, and the, the um, uh, all of the girt materials um, that, I, I, that I need. If it's a very large project and has lots of tonnage, then yes, I'm going to the steel mill to order that material. So we talk about detail material now. We talked about our main material, now we're going to talk about detail. Um, plate, uh, we can get uh, standard plate sizes, uh, which is 96,240. Uh, a lot of fabricators standardize on that size. Um, and they actually inventory. A lot of the plants that I've run in my career, we would inventory 96240 because that's the, the size of the plate machine, the plate processor that we have, can handle that very well. So we would stock from 3 eighths, half, 3 quarter, 1 inch, and in some cases, inch and a half. Anything after that, we would order um, custom sizes from there as needed. And most of the time, we'd have a drop. If you know the base plates are 2 inch base plates, we would have a drop left over from another job that we would just use. Um, now, some, some fabricators have larger plate processing machines, so they'll order um, a 10-foot by 40-foot plate, uh, 120 by 480, as opposed to the 8 by 20s. They'll pay the extra in shipping um, to get the 10-foot plate in there, so they have to take uh, plates on and off less of their machines. Um, minimum mill orders. If, if we've got a, a plate-heavy job, we can go to the mill to get it. Again, we stock plates, so we will just make mill orders on those sizes as needed. Um, again, you can get all this information off, offline on getting special size plates. As the plate gets thicker, we're limited on length, so we will need butt splices. We did a, uh, a parking structure that was plate girders, and um, they wanted clear span, so they went with plate girders instead of wide flanges, and we had to get splices in our flange material because the thicker the plate, we couldn't get as long, and each mill is a little bit different on how they roll their slabs. Um, and so that 
that that information is readily available. Now, if you get into a, a situation where you've got something custom, my, my recommendation is always to contact your local fabricator, um, and they'll be able to help you. They can do the legwork for you. If you say, hey, we're working on this job, what do you think of this material? And they'll be happy to do that legwork for you. Um, flat bar, it, you know, if we're doing uh, shear tabs, I know a lot of fabricators like shear tabs, and they'll use flat bar sizes. Uh, standard length on that is 20 footers. Um, and if they're a mist metal shop and they're doing a lot of egress stairs and rails, um, your kick plate, you know, quarter by four, quarter by five, um, and that comes in flat bar material. Um, angle, we can get angle, standard lengths are 40s. From the mill, I've got to order a minimum of 10,000 pounds. Now, I can get 50s and 60s, but again, it depends on the size and how long we want to wait. Um, a lot of times we'll get angle material that needs to be longer and we can't wait on the mill, so we end up doing a butt splice on those angles. Um, so that we can continue on with the project. Again, the rolling schedules, they're all online uh, for angle, plate, and flat bar. Uh, back to standard connections. So we talked about standard connections under detailing. If I'm, a, if I'm a highly automated shop and I want bolted, bolted clip angles where I'm going to bolt them on in the shop, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have bundles of 4 by 4 by 3 8 Some fabricators prefer to use 4 by 4 by 5 16 um, if I'm a welded bolted, I'm going to weld them on in the shop and bolt them in the field. And, you know, I'm going to be a 4 by 3.5 by 3 eighths or 4 by 3.5 by 3 sixteenths or 5 sixteenths, excuse me. Um, and I'm going to have mill bundles of that sitting in my yard that I'm going to run through my angle master. Um, so again, it goes back to my standard connections. So here we are ordering material. I talked about bundle quantities. So this is a shot right off Nucor Yamada's website. So if I'm looking at a 40-footer for a W27 by 94, and I'm going to be a 40-footer, I can get them in bundles of three. Now that doesn't mean I can just order three of them at 40-foot. I still have to fill out the, the, the balance of that trailer. Uh, I've got to have the truckload minimum quantities. But this tells you how many bundles they come in. If the job only requires one W27 by 94, 40 foot long, I'm going to go to a warehouse. The warehouse may or may not have that. They would buy from the mill and put the other two on the shelf. Um, but that's the, the convenience of a warehouse um, where I'm not going to stock two additional 2794s in my inventory. So ordering, all right, so here's the rolling schedule. Again, I just pulled this right off New Core Yamada, and I, I apologize, I, I just clipped the corner out of it. But if we're looking for, uh, say, a W33 between 118 and 169 in the weight, it's going to come out of their mill too, which is their heavy mill. And then here's the week that we will see um, when that material will be rolled. Now, the other thing that this does not tell us is it does not tell us when the tonnage has been already sold. So we can find a rolling schedule, and if we say, hey, I've got a bunch of W44s, oh, and it looks like it's rolling the week of November 18th, hey, that's great, uh, but the, it might already be full. So you still have to call the mill and find out, hey, is all the tonnage sold for that rolling or not? Um, so working with your local, local fabricator is, is very helpful in that aspect of finding out if, hey, I see that there is a, 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 roll, a rolling date here. Is that schedule open? Okay, project management, so managing submittals. So getting back to uh, under project management, um, managing all those submittals. We went through all those submittals we got to make. So that project manager has to work with the detailer and the construction manager um, and the customer getting all of those submittals in. And then they have to keep up the RFIs and the logs. You know, we talked a little bit about what an RFI is. Hey, it's just a question. We're trying to make sure that we're interpreting the design intent properly, or we see a detail that we'd like to change, so we're going to submit an RFI. But all those have to be managed. And I've seen a lot where they do those all electronically now, uh, where all of the RFIs are submitted into a um, like a website, and then it's distributed almost instantaneously to the people that need to see it. Uh, so technology is great. I remember when we used to have to um, fax those out. I remember, well, we won't talk about that right now, but when we actually got a fax machine. Uh, but nevertheless, we used to fax those out, um, and you never knew if they got them or not. Um, and if there's re revision to the contract documents, they've got to manage that to make sure that all parties get that, the detailer, the erector, the other su subs. Um, drawing logs, uh, drawing submittals and logs, making sure that all the drawings um, go out. If we're doing uh, PDFs electronically and they're all individuals instead of a one big binder, making sure that all the, 
uh, drawings got out, and then they've come back, and then buyouts. Uh, now, under buyouts, uh, the project manager is managing some middles, and what do I mean by buyouts? Well, when we buy out our bolts, you know, do certificates of conformances need to be submitted on bolts? What about the coatings? Do we need to submit that? Is that a requirement? Do they want to see what type of coatings we're using? Um, how about the, joist and bo the bar joist and deck that are on the job? Uh, we need to make sure we're submitting those plans. Um, if there's any bearings or other materials that we're buying, purchasing from, another sub or another vendor um, and providing. So all of those need to be, you know, what's the submittal requirements on that? Then budgeting. They're the ones that are minding the store. Are we doing all right on our material? We got a budget for our material. How are we doing on that? Are they managing the labor? How are we doing on the labor fabricating it? How about the subs? Making sure that's coming in. Um, other items, we just talked about it, uh, bolts, joist, deck, bearings, um, budgeting. How are we doing? We had a budget to begin with. Are we managing, are we minding the store is what I like to say. And then schedules, keeping everybody coordinating with the site, the erector, the customer. Um, I remember when uh, Microsoft Project came out, that was quite used quite frequently um, to schedule things. Um, I've seen Primavera, and I think it's P6 now is the, the, the current one. And that's a very powerful tool, and on big projects I've seen that used very successfully. Um, some of the medium-sized to smaller fabricators use an simple Excel sheet for scheduling. Uh, but the project manager is there herding all those cats, making sure everybody's you know, staying in line so that we can get the project done um, on time. So what we've talked about, we come to the end of project management, we've talked about project kickoff, scope of supply, ordering material. We spent a lot of time talking about the ordering of material um, because, again, it goes back to I've got to have drawings and I've got to have material to start fabricating steel. And then managing the submittals and the budgets and the schedules. So that brings us to the fun stuff, and that's production. So we're going to go through, uh, if you came to my shop and said, hey, I'd like to take a tour of your shop, and I'd be happy to, so if you ever find yourself in northern Massachusetts, please feel free to give me a call, and I love walking you through my plant. But when I do that, I walk you through a very specific way, and I try to walk you through in a very logical way on how the material flows. So when I was putting this session together, that's what I tried to do is, walk you through the process as if you and I are walking through my plant on how the material flows through the plant. So with that, we're going to start out with receiving the material from the mill, we're cutting the main material, putting holes in the main material, making our parts, then we lay out the main material, we start fitting the parts to it. If they're welded parts, we're going to weld it. If they're bolted parts, we're going to bolt, bolt it. If there's cambering required, how do we camber it? And then if we got to assemble it, and then we're going to clean it, we're going to coat it, and we're going to put it on a truck and ship it. So that's how I'd walk you through my plant. So we're going to do that as we go through. So uh, receiving material. We receive our material from the mill via truck or rail. 99% of everything we get comes in on truck. Uh, rail is a little bit difficult to get in. Uh, we do have access to a spur, but... Um, 99% of everything we have comes in on truck. Now, there are some uh, steel fabricators, and I've worked for a couple, that it, everything came in, 99% of everything they had came in on rail. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's a, pre a preference. So as we receive the material, I want to talk a little bit about material identification and traceability. So here we are. We've, we've gotten our load in from the mill, and we can see here's our bundle, our mill bundle, and we can see we've got one, two, three, four. So for this size, um, it comes in bundles of four. So that's what the mill bundling is. So traceability, if we go to the specification for structural steel, or AISC 360, which I refer to as the steel spec, uh, section N2.1 talks about material identification. It also takes us to Code of Standard Practice 6.1. 6.1 says demonstrate a method of material ID visible up until the point of assembling members. So if I have a beam or a column, I have to demonstrate that I can um, ID that material up until the point where I start fitting and welding or bolting on it. So how does that work? How do we do this? Okay, so when we receive a truck in, it's best for me just to walk you through it. When we receive a truck in from the mill, uh, we do a visual inspection per A6. We're just looking at the material, visually looking at it to see if there's any major kinks or bends or huge um, flange tilt or anything like that. If there is, we set it aside, um, and then we call our quality department to come take a look at it for disposition of that nonconformance. Once we get the material off the truck, we mark the material as we offload it with the heat number, the PO number, the job number, the size, etc. Each, each fabricator is a little different, but most of them get that information, heat number, sometimes a purchase order, definitely a job number, sometimes a size, and they place it in a specific, specific spot in the yard. 
And the reason they do that, especially those of us that are in the north, when we get a lot of snow and we have to go dig that out in the middle of January, we don't want to be looking all over the yard for it. We want to go right to the spot where it's at, dig it out, bring it in. Once we receive it, we turn the paperwork into the office. They update their uh, material inventory system. A lot of them use – there's three or four different products out there. Uh, some still use Excel. Uh, they update their, their material inventory system. And they say, okay, here's we put the heat number in. We've received this material. We have so many sticks of the 45-footers or what have you. They detail it all out. Or they input all that information into um, the software system um, so that later on when we're ready to bring that material in, we can issue a pull ticket to bring that material into the plant. Um, after we issue that pull ticket, we also have a nested cut list on how to process that material. Now, it's a lot easier just to see it visually. So here we are. We've got our beams again that we talked about. So then I just took a blow up of this. So we've got a 21, 62, 50 foot long. Here's our heat number, and here's our purchase order number, and here's the heat number. So I just blew up that section. So we've written it down on there. We've turned the paperwork in. Um, the mill tag that comes in with it, uh, this is what the mill actually puts on every beam. They tell you what size it is. Um, they tell you how long it is. Um, they give you the heat number, and they tell me there, there's four of them at that heat number. And then this one, for whatever reason, the customer wanted uh, CVN testing, so they've got a little note on there telling me that it is Sharpie V notch tested. Uh, nevertheless, the wide flange mills mark every piece that way. When we get our detail in, we will get a bundle of angle in, and it'll have one mark on it. And so here's the tag that they put on there. So before we break that, we will go through and mark. You can see here's the, the banding from the mill. Um, we will mark each and every piece with the size and the heat number so that we are able to tell where that goes to. So now the, the shop is ready to bring that material in, so we issue a uh, pull list. That's what we call a pull list. Uh, and then we tell them, hey, and, and this is just for our plant, we tell them, hey, no prelasses is required, it's released for fabrication, we don't have any third party inspector. And then here's the material I want you to pull. I want, to, I want you to pull three and a half by three by three eighths. Here's the grade, quantity, 40 footer. Here's our stock ID number that is issued by our um, uh, software package we use. But more importantly, here's the heat number. So right here I'm telling you, I can't put my arrow on it there. Right there is my heat number. And the same with the W12 and 72. Um, I'm gonna bring in 550s and 850s Here's my stock ID. Here's my heat number. Uh, here's the PO number that it was issued against. And then we record. Then most, almost all fabricators do the same thing. They take their uh, mill test reports they receive with that material and put it behind their purchase order number. So now I can trace those W12 with 72s right back to the heat number, right back to the PO number, and here's your mill test report. So that's how identification and traceability work. Now when I go to cut those, um, I, you know, I'm telling you what to bring in. And then here's a summary of everything I'm going to cut out of that size. And for whatever reason, the, the program said, hey, pick bar number three first. It's one at 50, stock ID number. Here's my PO number, and here's my heat number. And then I'm going to cut these pieces out of there. And here's the mark I'm going to put on there. So here's a main shipping mark, 101B. So that's a beam. We're going to cut four of them at nine inches. Boy, that's a long piece there. I hope we can handle that. Uh, nevertheless, then once it's cut, then it'll start carrying this mark number. So now I've fulfilled the requirements of what's required of me for material identification and traceability. So what does that look like? I wish I had that specific one. Oop, too quick on the gun there. Uh, I wish I had that specific one to show you, but here's what it looks like when we're done. After it gets cut, um, we put the ship mark on there, the job number, and the sequence number. So most fabricators throughout the United States follow the exact same process on material identification and traceability. So that's now we've got the material in. So let's talk about cutting. So for wide flange channel and large angle, most shops are using a bandsaw. For plate, we've got a burn table or, or a shear. Some of the older shops are still shearing material. But for the most part, uh, fabricators now use a burn table. And what I mean by burn table, we've got uh, plasma and oxy fuel, uh, CNC controlled. Some of those burn tables have automatic drilling and or punching on them. Uh, for small angles, we're going to shear them or saw them. Um, so in the steel spec, under section M2, item 2 addresses thermal cutting, because we still do some thermal cutting, and I have pictures to show you that. When we've got to prep the ends of a wide flange for a field uh, welded moment, or if we're going to do some um, uh, moment welds in the shop, um, and then if we have to do some copes on the beams to uh, fit under other beams, um, I'll show you how we do those copes also. Uh, code of standard practice 
uh, also in Section 6.2 addresses thermal cutting. So all of the gory details you can find in those two areas. So here we are, and I'm sawing. So here's my bandsaw. You can see my saw blade right there, and here's my wide flange being saw cut. And this is our automatic machine that measures it perfectly and then cuts it to the prescribed length. And then for the angle, we're using an angle master that the angle rides in here with the heel down, comes in, the holes get punched in it, and then it gets cut to length. Here's the front elevation view of that angle master, and again, looking at the guts of it. So that's how we um, cut our angle. You can actually run flat bar and small channel through that also. Uh, a lot of shops have those also for processing uh, angle, flat bar, and channel. Now here we are with our burn table, and here's our plate on the table. There's the edge of it, and this is our plasma getting busy cutting out all the parts. Um, this one does have drilling capability, so it will go through and drill the material first, and then come back and plasma burn it. And to do that, it's all CNC controlled, so here, are, here is our team member over here programming and nesting the material onto our stock size plate. Another action shot of our plasma getting after it, and then we also use OxyFuel. So I can tell this is plasma by the blue color as we're cutting that pattern shape out, and then this is OxyFuel because I can tell by the thickness of the plate and by the color of the, uh, uh, the burn there that it's OxyFuel. Uh, on the thicker plates, we have to use Oxy, uh, oxygen uh, fueled, um, whether it's ox oxygen acetylene or oxygen and natural gas or propane. Um, those are the different options for a cutting gas to go with the oxygen to cut through that thicker material. Uh, plasma, depending on the power of the plasma, can go um, as high as it needs to. Um, here we are burning, um, and we talk about that. Uh, we're bevel prepping the edges of this beam. Here's the action shot for you, and then again, here's um, once we're done. Now we'll come back and grind that, and as we said, I gave you the spec references to tell you where to look for all those requirements on how much grinding we need to do as we're bevel prepping that, and that's actually for a uh, moment connection that we're going to shop weld. Um, that's just a small stub that we're making. Um, nevertheless, that's uh, 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 torch cutting, if you will. Uh, here we are. Cutting again, and this is for cutting copes. Uh, as we get more and more automated in the shop, we're seeing these robotic arms that will actually cut the copes on the beams for the smaller beams that frame into the main load carrying beam. So here's a bunch of the parts that we've cut on our um, coping machine, and it's ready to be cleaned up and then headed down to blast and paint. So that takes care of cutting, so now we've got to put some holes in there. So where can we find information on hole making? Uh, again, in the steel spec, section M2.5 addresses bolted construction, and then the RCSC, or the Research Council on Structural Connections, all things bolts, section 3.3 talks about uh, bolt hole sizes, so that's where you can find all of your information on what uh, standard size, oversized slots. Um, and it talks about thermal cuts and burrs. Uh, most holes are produced um, either drilling or punching, uh, those are the main processes for um, hole making in the shop. So here we are, we've got a couple of different shots here. So this is our drill line, and you can see that we're drilling a flange of a wide flange and the opposite flange at the same time. Uh, high speed drilling, those the holes will be done in a matter of seconds. And again, you've seen the angle master, and this is a, you know, a punch line, the angle comes through and then it punches all the holes in there. And then you know, here's a little old school mag drilling. You set it up on a table and we're mag drilling some holes um, with the uh, magnetic punch, um, or the magnetic drill uh, making the holes in the material. So those are the, the standard hole making um, Parts. So now we have our main material cut and drilled, or cut and punched. We got the holes in there. We talked about our plate work, but we got to make our parts. So here's a part sheet, and we can tell this because it gives us a part mark over here, and this is a piece that's going to go into another assembly. We're going to fit it onto a main, um, a main member. Uh, parts go through the, the same process as the main uh, main material. We, you know, we receive the material in, we're going to cut it, and we're going to you know put the holes in it, and then we're going to go fit it. So one thing I like to do is when we're, when we're in, the, in, the, in the plant, we get all our main sticks done, we get all of our parts and pieces ready to go, because when we go to layout, I want to make sure all of the parts that the fitter needs to put on that piece is ready for him to go. So here we got our parts all labeled, ready to go on pallets, ready to send down to layout and fit. So we go to you know, layout, and so here's a short beam that we've got. Uh, here's we've got a short channel on this side, and this little gadget here is called a uh, flange gauge um, template, and what it does is it positions off the top flange, and then we're able to make these lines right here um, 
horizontally at a specific prescribed gauge off of the top flange makes it real easy to lay those out. Um, and then we just come back and measure for the vertical lines to the holes from the edge of the beam. And over here we're doing the same thing and we got a, uh, one of our employees laid out all the holes. He's writing down the information for fitting a piece. He's laid out these holes that we're going to come back and mag drill. So that's the layout. We actually go through and put um, soapstone. Here he's writing in paint stick, but we put soapstone on the steel saying where all the parts and pieces go to be fit on there. Now, again, as we get more and more automated in the shop, here we are doing some automated layout. So here we have a machine tool that's actually scribing the part, and here's the the piece mark, if you, um, the piece mark that's been scribed on there, so you can tell the fitter exactly where to put those pieces, and we can get down as far as actually scribing on the weld symbol. Uh, that's how detailed we can go. So once we have everything laid out, then we start fitting. So that's what my fitter is doing here. He's fitting this stiffener into this beam, and then over here, my fitter is dropping in all of these uh, parts to make a truss. So the, once it's all laid out, the fitter just picks up the detail and then starts fitting. And that's how we get all the detail onto the main sticks. Now again, talking about automation, here we see an automatic robot that will fit and weld the pieces onto it. Now these are in their infancy. There's several of them running here in North America. Um, uh, I'm not able to do the video here, but if we see here's our main stick and here's a piece that's been fit on there. We've got robotic arms that will come over and hold the detail on there and another robotic arm that comes over and tacks or completely welds the piece out. Then these, the curved pieces here then will rotate so that you can lay out all four sides of the wide flange. And again, these are in their infancy, but this is the future of fitting and welding for steel fabrication. Speaking of welding, uh, now we're at that part where we've got everything fit. Now we've got to weld it all up. So what are we going to weld to? Well, we're going to weld to the AWS D11, which is the structural welding code. And as we go through there, you have general requirements, design, pre-qualification, qualification, fabrication, inspection. What we're most interested in is the qualification. That's what we qualify all of our welders to. So when we submit to you welder quals, that all the welders in the shop are qualified to AWS D1.1. This is where you can go and see what tests that we've put them through. And then also with our welding procedures um, that we make a submittal on. So here's some action shots in the shop where the guys are making the welds. Uh, here we're using FluxCore and our shop. We like to give our employees these um, special welding hoods that actually provide them filtered air as they're sitting there with their head in the plume, um, sucking in all that uh, weld smoke, it does filter that out for them. And then here's a nice action shot of a submerged arc weld uh, that we're making on some plate girders. Um, here we've got a tractor that's actually putting down the weld. Um, right here it's submerged under a layer of flux, and out here is our preheat torch. Um, and this was for that parking garage that I was talking to you about that we made the plate girders on. Nevertheless, AWS D1.1 is where we find all the information on all things welded connection. And again, we're back to RCSC now as we're talking about bolted connections. RCSC, all things bolts, and what's important there is when we get to section four, the, the joint types. Here's where we define snug tight, pre-tensioned, and slip critical. So if you go to section four in the RCSC, that's where you'll find the definitions of what all that means. And the other thing is if we're doing pre-tensioned or slip critical, we need to go to section seven to make sure that we do the pre-installation verification testing. That we take three bolts per lot, per size, per diameter, per length, um, and test those bolts so that we know that, hey, when we pre-tension a joint or if that joint is slip critical, we are giving you the proper tension on that bolt. Uh, our shop, we tend to do quite a bit of bolting, shop bolting. Um, I went out to the receiving area and took a picture of all the bolts that were coming in. Now some of these are erection bolts um, and they come in these kegs, but most of them are shop bolts. And then I went over and took a picture of one of our guys and he is um, snugging up a bunch of bolts to bring them into the snug tight, snug tight condition. And then I wait, well, I, I waited until it went through the blaster, so it's all nice and clean for you. And then you can see here we have a bunch of pretension bolts. And the process we use, uh, according to the RCSE, is turn of the nut method. And you can go to the RCSE and see what that's all about. Um, cambering. There's two ways that I can camber a beam if it's specified. We can do mechanical, ben, mechanical cambering and heat cambering. The tolerances are given in the Code of Standard Practice 6.4.4. That's where you'll find the tolerances on cambering. Code of Standard Practice 6.4.4. So mechanical cambering, I have a device, and this is a plan view, where I've set my beam, beam in here, and I have a hydraulic ram. Here's one hydraulic ram and one hydraulic ram, and it actually pushes the camber into the piece. 
So that's mechanical cambering, and here's an end view of it so you can kind of see um, us pushing the camber into it. And then the other means of cambering is heat cambering. Now, I know what you're going to say right away, that's not cambering, that's sweeping. Yes, you're right. I couldn't find a good picture of us cambering, so I took a picture of us sweeping. But it, the, the idea is the same, where we put the V-heats. You can see the V-heat right here on the, on the piece. That's where they applied the heat. And then you see these other marks on there is our temperature indi indicating crayons so that we don't overheat the steel so that we know how hot we're getting it. In this case, we're sweeping. You can see our string line here. We're taking some sweep out of the, gir uh, out of the beam. Uh, when we're cambering, we put those V-heats um, in the web and in the flange to uh, induce camber into the beam, for typically for dead load deflection. All right, the next part under production is assembly. And here we got a couple of shots of doing some assembly. You've seen these before. And then you saw them in the erected position. And then here's another, this is a nice little uh, pedestrian bridge that we had to do some assembly on. But we do the assembly. So once we've got it all fabricated and assembled, then we have to clean it. And then what, what, the, the code that we follow is SSPC. And then these are the typical SSPC codes that we see for a solvent wipe. Uh, hand tool, which is just a wire brush clean. Power tool is a powered wire brush. White metal, we don't see too much SP5. Um, that's white metal blast. It's a lot. Uh, in structural work, we see a lot of commercial blast or even a brush off blast. SP10 is what we see when we have to do a zinc uh, primer. Under coatings, we can do a prime coat, uh, multi coat, hot dip galvanizing, and metallizing. All those are for different applications. Um, a lot of the time, it's just a prime coat that's required for the structural work. Um, um, uh, but if it's exposed to the elements, it might be multi-coat, or if it's AESS, they might, might multi-coat. Um, if we're exposed to the elements, maybe hot dip galvanizing. If it's too large of a piece to hot dip galvanize, then we can metallize. So there's different coatings that we can apply. So that gets us through fabrication, cleaning, and coating. So now we've got it all done. Now we need to ship the thing. So here we are on shipping. Um, and I'm going to talk about legal and permitted loads. Now, I need to warn you, sizes vary by state and city, so these are approximate. Check with your local fab shop. They'll be able to help you out if you've got a big assembly that you want to have shop fabricated and shipped. So I'm going to give you some sizes here. But again, please bear in mind these are approximate, and they really depend upon where you're at, especially when you get into the older metropolitan areas. It's very difficult to ship oversized loads into those areas. So a standard flatbed is 8 foot 6 wide. You can put a load on there 5 foot high. Or no, the, the bed comes up to 5 foot high. And they're either 48 or 53. I don't know where those lengths came from, but that's what they are. Standard flatbed, the, the bed itself is 8 6 wide. It's five foot off the ground, and it's either 48 foot long or 53 foot long. So a legal load, they'll let me go up to eight foot nine. I can I can split an inch and a half on each side. Uh, I can go eight foot nine. Um, height, I can go up to about 13 six. Again, you need to check because the height gets very tricky, especially in the older cities. Uh, length, I can go up to 55. If I'm on a 53 foot trailer, they'll let me overhang a uh, foot on the front, a foot on the back, and I'll be fine. I go to permit and signage. Uh, anything less than 14 foot on the width, again, it varies by city and state. Uh, the height is so variable, I'm not even going to try to address that when you get into the permitted loads, um, and then length up to about 85 feet. Special permits, that requires escorts, super loads, all of that. We're talking widths in excess of 14 feet. Again, the height varies. But when we get into really tall things, we can go with a drop deck trailer instead of having to use a standard flatbed. Um, and then lengths, anything over 85 feet. Uh, I've shipped stuff up to 130, 135 foot long. Uh, we had special... Uh, 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 trucking uh, beds and equipment to do that, and again, we've used drop deck t trailers. And then, if it gets too big, we'll just drop it on a barge and or drop it on a, uh, a boat and push it with a bar uh, drop it on a barge deck and push it with a boat. So, yeah, that was one of the projects we did. That was kind of fun, but uh, nevertheless, that's that's shipping. Um, so we've gone through the production process. We've talked a lot about a lot of different things, but I want to spend a little a few minutes here talking about quality control. And under quality control, um, we, uh, all of the shops that I've worked in have been AISC certified shops. And when we talk about quality, we don't just talk about, oh, I've got a guy that's doing inspection, right? I've got a guy, or we've got a quality uh, ingrained in every step of the process because AISC certification requires us to have a quality management system. So under there, I have to have uh, procedures 
and I have to prove that I have procedures that are implemented in management to make sure that management is committed to quality, that we're reviewing the contracts and the, and, and the specs, that the detailing has a, has a procedure that we're going to follow every time. Um, and then you heard that, you heard my detailing procedure. I went through it for you on our first thing we did. Um, our documents and data have control of them. We have control of our QC records, so when we're out there inspecting things, we control those quality of records. I have a procedure that's implemented. Purchasing, you heard my purchasing procedure. You heard my material identification procedure. I walked you through all the, the FAB processes, but I have a procedure on every one of those, and it has to be implemented. Uh, inspection and testing and then calibration of our equipment. Um, control of nonconformances. When we do make a mistake, because we have humans involved, there's going to be mistakes. So what happens when we, we find a mistake? We have to control that nonconformance so that it doesn't get shipped out to the customer. Then we have a, a corrective action procedure. How are we going to resolve that nonconformance? We go through that. We have a procedure on handling, storage, and delivering. We just talked about shipping of our material. Then I have to make sure our employees are trained, and I have to do an internal audit. So those are the, the parts of the quality control um, the quality management system that we have, and it, I, I really like that as a as a as the person that's responsible for our fabrication plant that we have all these policies and procedures because it's not just hey uh, we're going to fabricate everything and then uh, you know ha have the one person go over there and maybe it's going to maybe they're going to throw a tape on there maybe not maybe they're going to look at the welds maybe not but we have policies and procedures in place and they're implemented that we know that things are going to get measured things are going to get looked at and that's very important uh, especially to me because you know I want to make sure we put all this time and effort and energy into fabricating the steel when it gets to the field we want to make sure that it fits and having this quality management uh, uh, program um, really helps a lot it, it, I'll be honest, it helps me sleep at night, but it, it's a good business tool for us to help manage our fabrication process. Again, I walked through them, uh, I walked you through most of our procedures as we were going through each one of those when we were talking about detailing and purchasing and material identification. I walked you through all of our procedures as we were doing that. So, um, talking about quality control. Here we are. Here's our, our one of our quality inspectors out there measuring the length of a, of a piece, and he's got his tape measure out, and he's actually checking that. So when we talk about quality control, um, what are the tolerances that are out there under fabrication? So how do we know that, hey, this piece is a 16th long? How do we know that that's good? Where do we go to find that information? So the Code of Standard Practice Section 6.4 provides those fa fabrication tolerances. Uh, and I'm not sure if I said it or not, but the, the Code of Standard Practice is actually also in the steel manual. It's in the back where all of the, the codes and specs are, all the codes are, the, the code for designing, uh, the RCSE, and the Code of Standard Practice are all located in the back of that steel manual. So that handy reference right there for you. Um, the other place we can go to find uh, fabrication tolerances um, is uh, AWS D1.1. And where do we look for those? Well, on tolerances of joints and dimensions, you know, as we're fitting up a, a joint, we can go to 5.21. Uh, dimensional tolerances of welded structural members is 5.22. And then, you know, acceptance criteria of the weld profile, 5.23. Now, there's a lot more to that, but in the essence of time, you know, I can't spend a lot of time going through all of that. Um, information right now, but at least I'm giving you the, the reference and location in that reference where to go and, and find that information. Um, when we did get into, um, this came up, I'm going to go back one slide here, when we did get into a lot of bolted work where we had no, almost no work was welded, but we had bolted work, um, there was a, a, a white paper issued by uh, AISC our position paper issued by AISC saying that, hey, we can follow the same tolerances that they offer in D11 for bolted work as we can for welded work. Uh, that just came up, and I just wanted to throw that out there uh, as an extra, you know, free, no, free, no charge on that one. Uh, anyway, um, uh, session one, the introduction to this, reviewed in detail the steel spec chapter in. I was not going to spend time on that um, today since it's already been covered, and I think it's uh, the, the last session, session eight, does go back into quality assurance and quality control, and they'll spend more time in uh, the steel spec chapter in. So I was not going to address that tonight, but, but rather just talk about quality control from a fabricator's perspective. So wrapping things up here, uh, 
you know, summarizing where we've been. So we, we talked a lot about detailing and, and getting the drawings ready, because remember we talked about, hey, I've got to have drawings in uh, steel to start making sparks in the shop. So we spent a lot of time in detailing, um, talked about our advanced bill of material, very important. Then we talked about project management, and the, and the important takeaway out of project management was getting that mill, mill order in to make sure we're hitting those um, mill rolling dates. So we spent a lot of time in project management talking about purchasing. Then we walked through production. We talked about material in the yard, receiving the material, marking the material, bringing it in, cutting it, putting holes in it um, uh, on the main sticks, and then also prepping the detail. We showed the plate. We showed the angle master, making all the parts and pieces. And then we laid out the main material. And then we fit the detail material to it. Then we welded it or bolted it, depending upon what the drawings call for. And once that was all done, then we uh, cleaned, or we assembled it um, as it was required, and then we had to clean it. We had to blast clean it, um, or power tool clean it, or whatever the the recommendation or whatever the specifications called for, and then we coated it accordingly. Uh, from then, we had to pick the thing up and put it on a truck and get it to the site. And from there, we talked about quality control and the ASC certification process and what we use to um, manage the quality throughout our shop process. So I've said a lot tonight, and uh, there's a summarization of what we've gone through. Um, and at this time, I'm going to turn things back over to Brent and open it up for questions. OK. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, I would also encourage anyone who has not submitted a question yet, feel free to type that in now. And we will uh, do our best to address those before the conclusion tonight. But before we get to those questions, we do have a couple polling questions for our audience to answer. And uh, hopefully everyone has the hang of how we do this. You have an opportunity to submit your answer to these following two questions. So here's our first polling question. Where can you find preferred material grades? Is it A, in the Steel Construction Manual, Table 2, 4, and 2, 5? B, the Code of Standard Practice, Section 5. C, on steel mill, steel mill websites. D, in the AISC uh, Specification for Structural Steel Buildings, Chapter M. Or E, in AWS D1.1, Chapter 5. Simply click on the radio button uh, up on the screen and uh, submit your answer. We'll see how everyone does with this. Get about five more seconds. Again, where, where can you find the preferred material grades? All right, Chris, I think we'll uh, close the poll and look at the results. All right, looks like 94% of uh, the attendees said the manual tables 2, 4, and 2, 5. What do you think, Chris? That is correct. We're going to go with the 94%. They are spot on. Great. All right. People are following along pretty good. Let's see how they do on the next one. Uh, this is a question in regards to camber. Where can you find the tolerances for camber material? Is that an A, AWS D1.1? Uh, B, the RCSC bolt specification, C, the AISC specification, or D, the code of standard practice. Again, we're looking for where you can find the tolerances for camber material. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll, Chris. And we've got about 30% saying you can find that information in the specification and 70% saying the code of standard practice. What's the right answer, Chris? And, and again, it's the 70% has it. It's D, the code of standard practice. Okay. All right, very good. All right, let's get to some questions with the time we have left. Um, 
our first question. Um, you mentioned uh, with smaller jobs or the need for smaller amounts of material that you would just go to a warehouse. Is this the same as a service center? That is correct, yes. A steel warehouse and service center are synonymous. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to take us to slide 65. When you were going through the uh, the um, material report here, um, you mentioned that this 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 one in particular says no pre-blast up here. Uh, the question Correct. is, what what exactly does that mean? Sure, uh, we have some customers that require us to pre-blast all of our material before we bring it into the plant so that their outside inspector can do a visual inspection of that material. Now that's, that's very unusual, you don't see that too often, uh, but we have one specific customer we do a lot of work for, so we've made an adjustment to this report so that we can tell um, the employee in the yard, hey, when that comes in, it needs to go to the blast machine, or no, nope, it doesn't, it's just a regular job, and it does not require it to be going to the blast machine. So it's a specific requirement for one of our uh, repeat customers. Again, not, not a very common practice. Okay. Um, let me go back to slide 38. Uh, when you were talking about approvals, uh, the question came up as to what drawings need a PE to stamp them, and who is responsible for stamping those drawings? Sure, sure. That's that's a question that we get quite frequently. Um, the, the the drawings that need to get stamped are the design documents um, that we talked out about in uh, the previous slide on 4.1. That's the released for construction design documents require a PE stamp. Um, the next thing that could possibly require a PE stamp is if on the connection design, the ODRD selects option three and requires that the fabricator hires a licensed engineer where the work's being performed to um, design out all of the connections. And there's where a, a uh, a engineer's stamp would be required. Now, I've seen it in the past where there's been a request for the shop drawings to be sealed, um, but I've always cautioned our detailers, um, you know, if the engineer of record, pardon me, requires that, we always submit an RFI asking can they submit a, a letter to go along that he has, that the, um, license engineer in the state where the shop drawings are, uh, where the, the steel is going to be erected, that the shop drawings have been reviewed by a license engineer, that we submit, simply submit a letter. Uh, because stamping the uh, actual shop drawings themselves is saying that that engineer whose seal that they have put on that drawing says that they're, um, that's the right size and grade of material for the application when that is not the case. Uh, they're simply, the shop drawings are simply an interpretation of the design drawings um, and the engineer of record who has signed off or stamped off on the design drawings is actually the one who has sized the material, and the detailer um, is just simply interpreting that. Long answer. Did I get did I get enough answer on that one? Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Thanks, Chris. Okay, um, we have a couple questions on cambering, so we'll go to those next. Sure. Uh, a little visual here on slide 91. Um, sure. The first question is, what is the largest member you have cambered in the shop or you have seen cambered in the shop? Oh. Let's see here. We, uh, we, I, one, of the, one of the plants that I've managed, we fabricated some 16-foot deep girders, and those were cambered. Um, but since we were building up that section and not buying a rolled section, we actually cut curved the camber into the web um, and then used uh, heat to uh, adjust the camber to make sure that we were within um, tolerance of that. As far as a wide flange member, um, I think we did some 36-inch deep beams before we've cambered those. 
there's an art to using this machine that we have up there. Um, you can't just drop your beam in there, go to the mid-ordinate, and then start pressing in the required camber. You actually have to uh, hit it in three to five different locations, because if you just drop a beam in there and start pressing, you're going to end up buckling the web of that beam. So there's a little bit of an art to this. Um, the, the camera machine we have is limited. I think when we did those 36s, I think we submitted a procedure to do it all heat, um, as I recall. Okay. Is there is there a uh, is there a point at which the 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 width of the web could result in uh, in potential buckling during the cambering process? Yes, that's why we we try to you know when we get especially super light members that where the, the you know the flanges are light, very thin material, and the web is super thin, uh, we will actually you know put it in this press in five different locations um, on each side of the the mid ordinate of that beam or the center line of that beam, and slowly work the camber in there because if you just again if you just drop it right in the center and just start pressing, that web will buckle very quickly. Um, so, there, like I said, there's a little bit of an art to it, camber and using the mechanical machine. Okay, one more question here on cambering, and we'll move on to another topic. Sure. When it comes to cambering, do you drill the holes first and then camber? Doesn't doesn't this affect erection because the holes are not aligned as they should be? Uh, it's a great question. In in the building world, it, it we. We'll bring the material in, we'll cut it and drill it, or if your drill is in front of your saw, you'll drill it, then cut it, depending on how your plant's laid out. Um, but yes, we will cut it to length and put the holes in it, and then, the one, and then we'll fit all the detail and weld everything on. And then the le one of the last operations we do before we go to clean and paint is to put the camber into it and know that the, the, the slight amount of camber over the length of that will not offset the holes enough to cause a problem in erection. On the bridge world, we camber first, then put the holes in because there's so much more camber on on bridge beams or bridge girders that we have to put the camber in first, then draw, drill out all the uh, the splice holes. Okay, um, I'm on 56 here. One of the uh, main points of this section was ordering material. Uh, one question here is how how uh, where and when are the bolt lists prepared? Sure. Typically, we wait until the shop drawings go out for approval. Um, if it's a model job, the modeling software itself will actually give us um, field bolt quantities, not only a point-to-point -point list for the erector, but also the quantities for us to order. So once the job's completely modeled, or for sequencing the, the detailing as we talked about earlier, uh, we can purchase the field bolts right from the, the model. It'll just spit out a little report for us to order them. We don't want to order them too soon because if you get them on the site, if you get them out to the erector too soon, somehow they always grow legs and walk off. Okay, and and um, who who are the who are the the domestic mills today that our steel is coming from? Uh, Newcore Newcore um, provides a lot of bar material, which would be your flat bar, your angle, your channel. Nucor Yamato provides a lot of the wide flange. Uh, Steel Dynamics provides a lot of the uh, wide flange material. Um, and then you have your plate mills. Um, oh, shoot, I just dropped their name. It's the old Bethlehem um, LTV Inland. And then there's one out in Iowa. And then Nucor has a plate mill in the, one of the Carolinas. Um, so there's quite a few d domestic producers. Um, Arcelor, Arcelor Metal uh, owns a lot of the plate mills, um, the old Bethlehem, uh, the old Inland, the old LTV. Okay. Um, all right. I wasn't sure if it was this was taken from one of the materials reports or not, but the question is: Is there a reason why the standard length of steel tube is 21 feet? as compared to flat bar and <laughs> angles, which is 20 feet? That is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, the uh, flat bar and angle, they, they, they call it random 20s. Um, they used to come in quite a bit longer than 20, but nowadays with the uh, precision rolling capabilities in the mills, they can, they can cut it down quite a bit. 
Um, I don't know where the 21 foot came in for the tube. Um, I, I guess that's some Snapple cap trivia for another night. Okay. Okay, um, a couple more questions and we'll need to wrap up as we're, we're pretty much out of time here. Um, back to, um, to connection standards within a shop. Why, why might bolting be used instead of welding, welding, which in this person's opinion is typically more economical in the shop? Sure. It, a lot of that depends on the type of equipment you have. If you're highly automated and have drill lines, it's easier and quicker to drill holes than it is to fit angles to be welded on in the shop. So if we're talking about a standard double angle clip angle connection on a beam, uh, it's a lot quicker to drill the end of that beam and then just simply bolt on those two angles in the shop as opposed to fitting and welding if you leave it blank. But if you don't have a drill line, um, hand drilling or mag drilling those holes in the end of the beam, it takes a little bit more time than if, you're, if you have skilled employees that can fit and weld relatively quickly. Um, so again, it's, it's a function of the equipment you have in the shop and the skill of the employees on the, sh on the plant floor. Okay, and um, a couple more questions here. Is it, uh, when it comes to wide flange shapes, is it better to use a band saw or vertical saw for cutting? Um, uh, all the plants I have is a, is, is a, is a band saw. Um, you, you saw the one in the picture there. Um, and it, you know, the, the beam comes in web horizontal, and the bandsaw is a, a horizontal bandsaw. Uh, uh, slide 69, yeah, that's typical. The ones you see, it's just a, you know, it's on a certain pitch. Um, those are only ones I've used. I've, I've seen the old cold saws where you have a big, huge saw blade that comes in and engages it. Um, on the detail material, we will use a bandsaw that's a vertical saw, um, a little more control. Uh, but it seems like all the high-speed saws uh, that it's cutting all your main material look just like the one there in the picture. It might be a different name brand on the saw, but that's basically all of them run at that same angle, if you will. Um, they call that, I think they call that the attack angle. Um, and then they're, you know, it's just a horizontal bandsaw. Okay, and then one last question on connections. Sure. Um, an engineer specifies a welded, bolted standard frame beam connection while the fabricator, you brought this up in your presentation, well, the fabricator may prefer a bolted, bolted connection. So how does this get resolved or how do you convince the engineer to allow the other type of connection? Sure, a lot of times what we would do, uh, I, I ran a shop that was predominantly bolted, bolted connections. And if we saw, if we saw design details that, that were prescriptive in how the clip angle connections were to be done, a, a shop welded field bolted situation, we would si simply submit an RFI requesting that, hey, we would like to change this connection from what you have here to our standard clip angle. And then we always had our uh, design calcs behind it and saying, you know, here's the calcs to show that it's, you know, of the same capacity of what you're looking for. Um, most engineers, uh, most engineer records would be, okay, that's acceptable, or they know I want to see a, a, you know, a PE stamp on your calc, and then they would accept it. Or some would say, very few would say, no, I want it welded for a specific reason. And typically they would tell us that, and we're like, okay, you want it welded for a specific reason, fine, well, you know, we have no problem welding it. Um, uh, very few were the cases that they wouldn't accept what we submitted. Okay, all right. Well, thanks, Chris, and thanks to all who uh, submitted questions. If your question did not get answered tonight, we'll, uh, we'll work with Chris to uh, provide answers and follow up with you within the next week or so with an answer.